our next speaker, uh, who, is, who is Pete Lunn. Uh, Pete's an economist, uh, an author, and a former BBC journalist uh, who joined the ESRI, the Economic and Social Research Institute in Ireland in 2006. Uh, he originally trained as a neuroscientist. Uh, his primary research interest is economic decision making. Uh, he's a PhD in neuroscience and an MSc in economics, both, both from the University of London. Uh, so without further ado, Pete, it's over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. For the first time in my life, I feel like a primary school teacher. <laughs> um, I have very little expertise in energy efficiency. Um, why, you might therefore reasonably ask, do I have to spend the next 20 minutes listening to this man? Um, well, you don't, of course, but um, I guess the answer to that question is what I do know something about, or what I believe I know something about, and what I study is human decision-making, particularly economic decision-making, and particularly a certain kind of decision. Um, to give some reassurance to Ruth, who's worried about offending me as an economist, I'm a behavioral economist, so I think neoclassical economics has got it wrong anyway, right? largely and in a lot of markets. There's a lot in neoclassical economics that's really important, and my final slide is going to mention one of those things. But there are a lot of places it gets it spectacularly wrong, and where it usually gets it spectacularly wrong is where individuals have to make economic decisions where they are uncertain they face a degree of risk, they're uncertain about the decision, they're uncertain about the degree of risk, and the consequences occur over periods of time. And wherever individuals are making those circumstances, those decisions, neoclassical economic models have simply got it wrong. And the reason there is such interest in behavioural economics is because of that, because the science is unequivocally now showing that, and it's easy to see that if we have a better understanding of how people make those kind of decisions, we should be able to use that information to devise better policies. So while I'm not an expert in energy efficiency, what I do know about is some of those decisions. And I have read the way behavioural economics is being applied to energy efficiency, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and as far as I can see, decisions that individuals make, particularly households but also businesses, make about energy efficiency are that type of decision where if you don't take a behavioural economic approach, you will get it spectacularly wrong, and where taking a behavioural economic approach, I think, has a lot of potential for designing better policies. OK, how am I going to do that? We're going to do four experiments and get four <coughs> findings. I'm then going to tell you how I think those findings apply to the issue of energy efficiency, OK? So that we might understand how a decision maker who's thinking about a decision involving energy efficiency might behave, might decide. Okay? Given we have that understanding, I'm then going to throw out some ideas about what we might do with that understanding. More importantly than those ideas, I'm then going to talk about what, how you approach it, what method you use if you've got a bunch of behavioural ideas to get them into the policy domain. And then finally, I'm going to give you a 150-year-old warning. Okay? And I'm going to do all of that in less than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you did hear right, we are going to do experiments. And you are involved. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in a minute for either option A or option B or option C or option D. <coughs> and I want you to do one or the other. Right? And if you don't, I can see who you are. <laughs> right. The best way to understand what behavioural economics does is to do an experiment. And here's our experiment. Here's the first one. There's going to be four of them. I'm a very generous man. I've just given you 30 euros. Okay? And I'm now offering you the following choice. You can either simply have another 10 euros, or you can toss a coin. If you win you get 20 euro, but if you lose, you get nothing more. So you're getting 30 anyway, you can either have a definite 10 extra, or you can toss a coin and go for 20 versus nothing extra. Okay, who is going to take the definite 10 euros in the hand extra? And who's going to toss the coin? Okay, I'm going to call that 60-40 for the definite 10. I'm going to change the game. I've become more generous. I'm going to give you 50 euros. On condition, you take one of the following two options. Either that's a screwed up 10 euro note. You just have to give me 10 euros back. Okay? I'm going to give you 50 euros. You, I, just give me 10 euros back. Or you can toss a coin. If you win, you get to keep the whole 50 euro. But if you lose, you've got to give me 20 back. Okay? Everyone got it? I've given you 50. You've either definitely got to give me 10, or you can toss a coin to try and keep it all, but you've got to give me 20 if you lose. Now, 
Who's just going to give me 10 euros back? And who's going to toss the coin? The majority switched. Who tossed the coin the first time, but not the second time? Who tossed the coin the second time, but not the first time? Right, we've all just violated neoclassical economics. <laughs> right, that's how easy it is to do. Right? Um, as many of you will have worked out, the two scenarios are actually identical logically. In terms of outcomes, they're completely identical. Okay? And about half of all human beings switch between the two scenarios. Mostly, they switch from not tossing the coin in the first scenario and tossing it in the second scenario. It, it usually goes 60-40 or 70-30 in favour of the definite 10 in the first scenario and in favour of tossing the coin in the second. Okay? Logically, the two are identical. If you need persuading of that, it's pretty straightforward. You either definitely walk away with 40 euros, or on a 50-50 bet, you walk away with 30 or 50. Right? They're logically identical, but they feel completely different. It's called a framing effect in behavioral economics. How I frame the environment in which you make the decision dramatically alters your decision. Okay? And in this case, finding number one, what this experiment shows, this was first done in a seminal paper by Kahneman and Tversky in Econometric in 1979, what this experiment shows is that people dislike losses relevant to equivalent gains and will take risks to avoid them. That's why the majority switch towards tossing the coin. Most people are risk averse, right? The expected value of that bet is 40 euro, but they'd rather have the definite 40 <coughs> euro than take the risk. But they're only risk averse when they're making gains. When you give them the money and it's about how much they give back, most people will take risks to avoid losses because human beings don't like suffering losses more than they like equivalent gains. That's one of the classic findings of behavioral economics, finding number one. Let's do another experiment. Here we go. Scenario number two. I'm getting more generous now. You can either have 100 euros today, or if you come back tomorrow, you can have 105. Who is going to take the 100 now in your hand? Who's going to wait and take 105 tomorrow? For a bunch of probably quite financially illiterate people, half of you just turned down an interest rate of 5% a day. Um, but maybe I'm not that trustworthy. <laughs> Scenario number two. You can either have 100 euros in 30 days' time, or you can have 105 in 31 days. I think we get an idea what's going on here, don't we? <laughs> Is anyone going to take 100 euros in 30 days over 105 in 31? No. You've done it again. You've just violated neoclassical economics. Why aren't you discounting a day at a constant interest rate? What's going on, guys? You're pricing a day completely differently when it's the difference between today and tomorrow and when it's the difference between 30 days' time and 31 days' time. What this means is your time inconsistent. What it means is I can ask you this question today, this, sorry, I can ask you this question today, and you'll say, oh, I'll take 31 days' time, 105 euros, please. And then 30 day, in 30 days' time, I come along and I ask you this question, and you've changed your mind. <laughs> people don't discount time consistently. Finding number two, people discount the future sharply. Right? The difference between today and tomorrow, time to us now, is much more precious than the equivalent amount of time or money in the future. People discount the future sharply, resulting in time and consistent decisions. Experiment number three. Which of these two would you rather put a 10 euro bet on? Is life expectancy in India greater than or less than 60? Or, question two, will Irish house prices <laughs> go up or down in 2016? Now, if you had to put a bet on the outcome of one of these two binary choices, right? one of these two binary outcomes, which one would you bet on? Who would bet on question one? And who would bet on question two? The large majority of you have bet on question two. I reckon you're no better at two than you are at one, by the way. Right? And there's a lot of science that doesn't show that, but shows something similar. Okay? What happens? The classic finding here is this. People are more willing to take risks on matters they are familiar with or about which they feel more competent to assess the risk, even if, in fact, they're not. In other words, I could do that experiment, and I can also do it and look at the outcomes, and I can see, were, you, were people actually more accurate? Were they better at assessing one question or the other? And what turns out to be the case is, for equivalent abilities at actually assessing the right answer, people are biased towards betting. They'll bet more money. They'll take more risk in circumstances where they feel competent or familiar, even if they're not more competent in answering the question. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, life expectancy in India is greater than 60, and house prices in Dublin next year, I have no idea. <laughs> Although some of my colleagues bizarrely think they do. Shh. Okay. 
A fourth and famous experiment. Which line is shorter? What I love about this is the worried faces. <laughs> uh, you know at this stage I've already got quite tricksy on you, and now I'm shut around. Okay, of course it's C. We can all see it's C. C is plainly and clearly shorter. Okay? However, let me give you a different scenario. Supposing you walked into a room and saw this display, okay, and there were five people in the room, and I asked the first person, I said, which line is shorter? And the person said, A. I asked the second person, oh, yeah, A. Third person, mm, yeah, A. Fourth person, oh, yeah, A. You're the fifth person. I ask you, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do? We already said C. Well, yes, but not in that scenario. The answer to the question, most people actually say, oh, I'd say C. I know my own mind. I can see what I can see. I mean, I would say C. The classic finding replicated many times is goes right back to a psychologist called Ash in 1951. It's a classic finding. is that almost half of people sit there and say, A. Now, that's normally interpreted as a form of conformity, which I suppose in a way it kind of is, but it tells you something absolutely profound about human decision-making, which is this. Uh, this is not true. We are not all individuals, and actually people copy the decisions of others and feel uncomfortable departing from the norm. Right, I've given you four principles about how people make decisions that are backed by enormous literatures in experimental psychology and in behavioural economics. I've given you four principles about how people make decisions when they're faced with uncertainty. And in this case, actually, this isn't even very much uncertainty, right? Because you can see that line C is shorter than the others. Interestingly, if you ask people in this experiment, right, if you say to them, why did you say A? They say, well, I thought I must be making some kind of mistake. And when you think about it, there's nothing irrational about that at all. If you watch four seemingly smart people say A, the probability that you're making a mistake is non-negligible, right? Because there must be some reason why they're doing what they're doing, right? So there's very good reasons why we feel uncomfortable departing from norms, okay? So I've given you four principles about how people make decisions when they have consequences over time and when they face uncertainty. Now, <coughs> a DM in the jargon of my academic discipline means a decision maker. And a decision maker is not necessarily an individual. It could be a couple or it could be a firm. In this case, I've got my rather untypical couple there. Okay? And they're trying to decide on some energy efficiency measure. Um, this doesn't have to be a big long-term investment. This could be a very short-term decision. Okay? But it's some kind of energy efficiency measure. Right, we've learned four principles of behavioral economics backed by experimental science. What do they tell us about how this decision might be made? Well, the initial outlay involves losses in terms of money, time, and convenience. Convenience, Ruth stressed earlier, really, really important one. How inconvenient is it to make the initial outlay, as well as how much does it cost and how much time is involved? <coughs> the losses, those losses, are immediate. The energy efficiency gain is in the future. Well, we know people weigh the immediate much more than they weigh the future. You guys all did it about five minutes ago. Okay? We know that the size of the gain is uncertain, unless they're engineers who know an awful lot about energy efficiency. They've got to decide whether they trust what they're being told, but in any case, the outcome's uncertain, even if what they're being told is true about this science, because it all comes down, as Ruth has said, to how they use it and how their own behaviour changes in the future. The decision-maker lacks familiarity with the decision. By definition, these are once-off decisions they've not made before, or very unlikely to have made before, unless this is the second time they've moved into a home and made the same decision. The decision-maker can't actually easily observe the decisions of others. They don't know what the social norms are. They don't know what other people do. You can't actually see what people have done in their own homes and how much insulation other people have in their attics. It's not something that hits you in the face every day unless you go into other people's attics, which I suspect you don't. Okay? Know something else. All of this stuff is true whatever the decision-maker's ethical views on energy efficiency, climate change, and related issues. Right? All of these things are true and affect their decision regardless of their ethical views. If you want to understand why there's such a massive gap between people's stated attitudes and intentions and their behaviour, as a behavioural economist, I'm trying to tell you what I think is the massive gap, okay, or a significant contributor to it. Orthodox financial incentives may not work. I originally wrote the slide slightly stronger. I originally wrote, will not work, and then I just reined back a little bit. Right? <laughs> Information education also do not necessarily help. Because the structure of this decision, how uncertain people are, the timescale over which it operates, the immediate losses versus the future gains, all of that structure is unaffected largely by education and information. 
Okay. So given we know these principles, and we know this is, these are like behavioral barriers to people making good long-term energy efficient decisions, well, what, what might a behavioral economist suggest to a policymaker? Well, there's a disclaimer. <laughs> these are just ideas. Some of these ideas have been put about by behavioral economists in the literature already. Some of them have actually been tried in countries and people have even done randomized controlled trials on some of them. Some of them I came up with off the top of my head yesterday. Okay? But here are some things you might do. First of all, highlight the cost of not acting rather than the savings. People worry about losses more than gains. So tell them how much it costs not to do something, not how much they save. <coughs> Stress immediate benefits. Right? As well as getting long-term savings on energy efficiency, well, why not make your house more cosy this winter, guys? Use time-limited incentives. This is one of my favorite behavioral charts. Does everyone remember the SSIAs? Where the government gave all the middle class people free money. Do you remember that? <laughs> okay. This was the time scale over which people took them up. Right? Here, you'll be unsurprised to learn, was the deadline <laughs> for engaging in the scheme, right? Remember that finding about how people value time. Today and tomorrow matter much more to us than time in the future. So people kept saying, oh, I'll get around to that, I'll get around to that, I'll get around to that. It was only when the sword was on the back of the neck that they were going to miss out and have a massive FOMO of not getting the free money from the government suddenly they all sign up. Well, so why not have a subsidy scheme that actually says, look, we'll subsidize you coming into the winter, but if you haven't done it by October the 31st, forget it, you can't get the money. Would it work? I don't know. Um, employ total lifetime cost pricing. That I know has been shown to be effective um, in some of the literature already. There's debate about the effect size. But if you price things with total cost pricing across its lifetime and make consumers aware of that, it pushes them more towards energy efficient products. There's some evidence for that already. Uh, use social feedback. That's extremely important. Um, there's some really nice stuff on smart meters that's been done in the Netherlands, actually, using persuasive technologies. If you design a smart meter so it doesn't just give people feedback about how much energy they're using in the house, it gives them a lovely smiley face when they're <coughs> not using much and a big frown when they're using too much, it has a bigger effect on their energy use within the home because we're human beings and we respond to, we respond to emotional social feedback. Um, set energy deficient defaults. There's a nice study recently that's been done in Germany whereby the default when you sign up to energy with the company is to go for the green energy option and you have to actively choose to opt out into the non-green energy option. As soon as you change the default on people's choices, more people sign up to the green energy. Devise and test feedback systems. Right? Because people are so uncertain about these decisions, what psychologists will tell you and what behavioral economists will tell you is if you can give people salient, real-time feedback, they are more likely to change their behavior. Devise and test behavioral informed labels. That is not just um, about labels, actually. I mean, all things like websites, fact sheets, information that we give people, right, can be designed with some of these behavioral findings in mind and tested in experimental context before. These are all things that you might do if you wanted a behavioral informed policy. But... Some of them may work, some of them may not work. I have absolutely no idea. All I can tell you is that they're backed by a degree of experimental science. So if we do want a more behaviorally informed policy to try and make people take, take up energy efficient measures, how do we go about it? Uh, this is less of a disclaimer. Um, I shamelessly put my own report for the OECD on the title page of, the, of this talk, which most of you probably didn't even notice. Um, and I've been watching, uh, that was a, a survey of how behavioral economics is being used around the world by policymakers. So I spent an awful lot of time talking to my counterparts in other countries around the world and talking about how the science is being used. And this slide really is informed by that. And the reason I say these are recommendations is that, as far as I can see, this gives you an idea of how it's being used best. Right? But the reason I say at least in an ideal world is, of course, <coughs> I'm saying... These are only recommendations if you decide to put in place a research program or a policy development program that uses these things. You might not have the priority to do that. You might not have the resources to do that. You might not have the political will to do that. But if you do, these are recommendations about how you might do it. Okay? Not that we're cautious at the SRI or anything about sticking our necks out. Um, devise behavioral informed interventions. Well, that's kind of obvious. Use experience elsewhere. First thing to do if you want to go down this route is look at what's worked elsewhere, and we've heard from Ruth quite a lot about that already. There is an explosion in behaviorally informed policy around the world, and you need to look at what's going on in that. Harness behavioral expertise. That's really, really important. 
Right? There is a limited amount of it, and we have a capacity problem in this in Ireland at the moment, and we need to do something about it. Nobody is teaching this science in our universities. Actually, that's not strictly true. You can do a module, if you're an economics student, with Kevin Denny at UCD, and that's the only place, pretty much, it's being taught. We are not churning out behavioural economists who understand this decision. Right? But what ex expertise we have, harness it. Right? Devise the intervention, test them. Right? Do it in lab decision-making tasks. There's loads of decisions you can test in well-designed laboratory experiments. Do it in pilots. Where possible, of course, use the gold standard for testing a policy intervention, which is a randomised controlled trial. Do it in collaboration with the private sector. Where this is working really well in other countries, regulators are giving incentives to private companies to trial some of the ideas, so that the private company gets involved in trialling what effectively is a regulatory idea or a government programme. Right? Really important point. What this is telling you, what came out of doing that OECD study that I did, was that this is very much a development, right? The way that behavioural economics operates is a completely different methodology. People usually go to economists for advice, and they get, well, economic theory tells you this is the way to do it. Our model, we can deduce from our model, this is the way to go about it. This is the way to set up the incentives, right? Behavioural economics has what's called an inductive scientific approach. It uses the inductive scientific method. What does that mean? It means you start off by saying, we don't know how people behave. What we're going to do is observe it. And if we see patterns repeatedly observed we'll assume they're going to keep doing it. That's inductive logic. Right? If I keep seeing something happen, I assume it's going to happen again. Inductive logic is not foolproof, as a turkey could tell you. Right? For 11 months a year, somebody comes along and feeds it. Right? So surely in the 12th month, they're going to do it again. But you know what? The context changed. It's Christmas. Bye-bye, turkey. Right? So inductive logic is not foolproof. And that is true of all these behavioural ideas I'm talking about, right? Because they work in many contexts, and then suddenly we put them into another context, and they don't suddenly work, and we have to try and understand why. This is scientific work in progress, and what's happening is that science is getting rolled into policy development processes, but because of that, and because we don't always understand the behaviours we're dealing with, it's really important to do it empirically. So the big message here is, above all, if you want to do this, you've got to be empirical about how you do it. My wife says that my gravestone is going to read, we need more and better empirics. Right? And it is the thing I would say most more than anything. Okay, here comes the 150-year-old warning. I broke my promise, I'm at 21 minutes. This is my last slide, apologies. That is William Stanley Jevons, who in 1865 noted that greater efficiency of coal use increased coal consumption. Right? Then it was called Jevons' paradox. Now you read about it as the rebound effect, and Jevons is usually not even cited. We have known about this for 150 years. And you know what? This is where neoclassical economics earns its stripes. Because if you make the price of something cheaper, which energy efficiency effectively does to energy, what are people likely to do? Answer, use more of it. Right? That's where neoclassical economics earns its stripes. Okay? Or at least price theory does. People do respond to prices. Okay? Now... Given that's true, I would say this. I had a look before this talk um, about estimates of the size of the rebound effect on energy efficiency. They vary from over 100% to 0% in the literature. Right? You could, I mean, nobody can measure this thing accurately. And what it seems to me that you discover from that, actually, and what I think is really interesting, is that in each context, it's, a, it's an empirical matter, actually. In each context, you get a very different kind of rebound effect. So there's no simple elasticity of the price of energy that's going to tell you, if you change the price of energy, how much more or less of it people are going to use. It depends what the behaviour involved is and what the context in which you've improved the energy efficiency is. So yeah, neoclassical economics earns some of its stripes, but it's not a simple elasticity. It's really context dependent, which means you've got to be empirical and inductive about how much difference it makes to energy usage as well. But, right, there's that rebound effect. Here's the good thing, right, even if there is a substantial rebound effect, the important thing to understand is that effectively, by increasing people's energy efficiency, you have made them less poor and more able to heat their homes. And what does that mean? It means you can get away with raising the price of energy more easily without making people poor and cold. And that's incredibly important. It goes back to the side effects that Ruth was talking about earlier. So even if there is a rebound effect, it does not negate energy efficiency policies. Far from it. It just turns them into an anti-poverty measure effectively, or into a home heating help measure. And those are really important consequences. Or, as also been pointed out, it has potentially beneficial health consequences. Okay? That's what I've said. Um, I'm a little bit over time, so I'm not going to say any more other than that. 
and to say thank you very much for your attention.